I now will turn this over to uh, Leslie Morris, the uh, professor and chair of the department of GNSD, um, and who will say a few remarks. Well, I'll just keep this brief since we're getting a later start. Sonia, warmest welcome to you. I'm so glad we're all finally here. It's an act of something that managed, that enabled us to all uh, figure this out. So is all here. Uh, this is a course on German Jewish uh, culture, German and Jewish cultures at the margins. So we're really thrilled to, to also be able to welcome you. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Jamel Watkins, who will introduce you. Yes, I'd like to echo my colleagues. We're so happy to that we were able to make this happen. And uh, I'll, I'm just going to give a brief bio and uh, so we can start hearing um, about your project. Um, Sonia Golans is lecturer in Yiddish at the University College London. She's a scholar of Yiddish studies and German Jewish literature whose work focuses on dance, theater, and gender. She received her PhD in Germanic literatures, languages and literatures from the University of Pennsylvania and has taught previously at the University of Vienna, The Ohio State University and the University of Göttingen. Please, Sonia, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. And, um, and especially Jamel for the, um, for the introduction. And I'm you know, very happy to share my work with you. So let's see. See, sharing the screen. Okay, let's take a moment. All right, great. One moment. So I'm going, um, I'm going to be starting with a the. for some reason the I'm having trouble with the tab so that I can see my talk at the same time. Let me try one more time. I might need to not show the full slide. So, so, so yeah, you, you might want to exit your full your full screen yeah, so in the view. That might help. Uh, yeah. So the way that it usually works is for some reason it's not working. Um, so I might need to just not have it be the full PowerPoint. I'm very sorry about that. Um, but otherwise I won't be able to see my notes. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with that. Um, in any case, so I'm going to start with this example from contemporary television and show how it relates to 19th century popular fiction. So based on Deborah Feldman's 2012 memoir about leaving the Satmar Hasidic community of her birth, the German-American Netflix series Unorthodox draws sharp, context, uh, con sharp contrasts between the protagonist Esti Shapiro's old life in Brooklyn and the new freedoms she experiences in Berlin. The third, the third episode focuses on Esti's sexual difficulties with her husband, Yankee, and her discovery of sexual freedom through a night of liberated dancing with her new friend, Robert.
There was a world of difference between the chaste ritual dance performed by Esti and Yankee at their wedding and the earthy scene between Esti and Robert in a Berlin club, which you see here. The latter encounter is in, presented as an important positive step in Esti's escape as it's presented from orthodoxy. That unorthodox is not unique in suggesting that pious women need to leave a traditional Jewish world in order to find men who can please them on the dance floor and, by extension, in bed. In juxtaposing the sexual dysfunction scenes with the interlude in the club, unorthodox repeats several tropes that appeared in literary texts from the 19th and early 20th centuries. These works deployed the motif of transgressive dancing as a way of addressing the dramatic social changes Jews experienced in the modern era especially since, for many writers, dancing was the most physically intimate act they were willing to describe in the written word. My talk today emerges from my new book. Yeah. Yes. My new book, It Could Lead to Dancing, Mixed Sex Dancing in Jewish Modernity, which was published with Stanford University Press in May. As the title suggests, my book investigates the role of mixed sex dancing in modern Jewish culture, focusing primarily on dance scenes in German and Yiddish literary texts from the 19th and early 20th centuries. And so just a few definitions to make sure that we're all on the same page. By dance scenes, I mean literary depictions of people dancing. They could be a whole chapter or just a brief mention. I use the term mixed sex dancing in my book to show that a lot of concerns about boundary crossing on the dance floor are specifically about men and women partnering together. And I use sex instead of gender because a lot of these concerns ultimately relate to the physical bodies of the dancers instead of whether they identify as male or female. Okay, so now we have the table of contents. In my book, I examine the role of mixed sex dancing in five particular dance spaces. Dancing lessons in chapter two, taverns in chapter three, balls in chapter four, weddings in chapter five, and the New York immigrant dance culture that was loosely associated with dance halls in chapter six. By examining these different dance spaces, I show that dance was everywhere. In rural taverns in Poland, dancing academies in Nuremberg, elite balls in London, and dance halls on the Lower East Side. So. Over the next roughly 30 minutes, I will introduce you to some of the main arguments of my book, explain why mixed sex dancing is an important modern, a metaphor for modernity in Jewish culture, and walk you through a particularly illustrative example from a German novella. Finally, I'll conclude with a discussion of my German literary corpus and how it relates to the scope of the book overall, as well as a few words about mixed sex dancing in contemporary literature and film. Dance scenes appear throughout literature as places for young people to meet, flirt, and form relationships. As any reader of Romeo and Juliet, War and Peace, or Pride and Prejudice can confirm. Dance scenes are a way for writers to criticize societal expectations about courtship while simultaneously entertaining their readers. My book demonstrates that dance is a powerful tool for narrating Jewish social inclusion and exclusion. So that's the, I would like to think of that as the Jewish version of the previous slide. Okay. Dance scenes help characters negotiate religious, class, and national boundaries in a transgressive fashion, since the dance floor is a space where individuals can meet and form relationships with dance partners who are not regarded as acceptable marriage partners. Dance scenes are particularly important in literary texts from the 19th and early 20th centuries, which discuss how Jews tried to integrate into European society. Dance plays an important role in debates about Jewish acculturation, especially since Jewish law prohibits men and women from dancing together. Literary depictions of Jewish mixed sex dancing demonstrate the sheer variety of perspectives on Jewish emancipation and ideas about Jewish modernity and show how these concerns are related to ideas about Jewish bodies. My book traces a popular but largely unexamined trope of modern Jewish culture that transcends class, gender, and national boundaries, because everybody likes to dance. It's the first book to focus on um, 
European Jewish social dance. And what's more, it could lead to dancing analyzes literary and cultural representations of mixed sex dancing, focusing on German and Yiddish literature. My book shows the specific literary qualities of dance scenes, such as the way that dance and dances aid in plot and character development, as we saw in the case of Esti and or Unorthodox. I also identify parallels between dance figures and plot structures. So in other words, a book that has a circular dance um, might also have a sense of repetition or coming full circle in the end. I also pay close attention to the broader social repercussions of Jewish dance. While contemporary popular culture often portrays Jewish mixed sex dancing as either absolutely forbidden in an orthodox context or as the punchline of a dirty joke, dance provided 19th and early 20th century writers with a powerful metaphor that could be employed with great versatility. Writers used dance scenes to showcase their protagonists' explorations of their social boundaries and sexual possibilities. Dance gives expression to unruly desires in a deceptively permissive space. Yet when the dancing stops, the dominant social structures remain enforced and characters who do, who do not adapt their passions often suffer tragic consequences. Dance is crucial in German Jewish and Yiddish literature because it conveys the temptations of non-Jewish culture across gender and class lines, revealing the way the Jewish modernity was often a story of Jewish participation in mixed sex leisure activities. I want to stop it. Ah, there we go. Between the late 18th and early 20th centuries, a shift appears to have taken place in attitudes towards the prohibition on mixed sex dancing. Jewish participation in transgressive dancing was not a new phenomenon. Rabbis had been prohibiting mixed sex dancing and Jewish communities had been finding ways around the restrictions for centuries. Yet while earlier Jewish writings on the topic tended to emphasize the threat of sexual impropriety within a, a communal context, so for instance, adultery, starting around 1780, there was a greater concern, particularly in literary fiction, with the relationship between improper dancing and the violation of religious or class boundaries. In short, improper dancing was understood to reveal the influence of values from outside the traditional community, and such behavior demanded a fitting response. Modernity offered Jews new possibilities outside of their religious communities, and these options for social mobility were quite literally embodied on the dance floor. Dance became an important metaphor for the process of acculturation in literary texts coinciding with three historical phenomena. And I have a slide for you so you can follow along. All right, so greater Jewish integration in non-Jewish society, the evolving concept of companionate marriage, so love matches, and the increased popularity of intimate partner dances across social classes. Dances such as the waltz involved extensive physical contact and provided more opportunities for dance partners to individualize their interaction on the dance floor rather than relying on the directives of the master. In the period following the Enlightenment, religious communities were forever changed by the growth of secularism and Jewish communities in particular grappled with acculturation, religious reform, and political emancipation. Even within a Jewish communal context, interpretations of Jewish law did not necessarily carry the same force as in previous generations, and it was necessary for authorities to appeal to such communal concerns as Jewish continuity, anti-Semitism, the family, and bourgeois propriety. Writers of Jewish popular fiction, whether they were religiously inclined or staunchly secular, portrayed mixed sex dancing as a threat to the social order. And just for information about this slide, this is a list of different dances that were performed at a Jewish ball. So you can get a sense that these um, ballroom dances were also performed in a Jewish social context. All right, so we're talking about the threats. However, not all mixed sex dancing was equally subject to criticism. Dances in bourgeois German Jewish social clubs or among Yiddish speaking immigrants on New York's Lower East Side may have just seemed like new popular fun. 
Although these types of dances represented a new form of courtship, one which fostered love matches rather than arranged marriages, they did not necessarily challenge the composition of the matches themselves, since participants in these social events were generally in the same class, educational, or religious group. The true controversy occurred in life, and certainly in literature, when individuals danced with, flirted with, and maybe even married those, those whom their friends, their families, and communities would not have considered an appropriate match. As such, literary depictions of mixed-sex dancing typically involve multiple forms of social mixing. They concern dance partners of different genders, but also involve transgression of religious, class, or ethnic boundaries. It is no coincidence that such anxiety about mixed sex dancing coincided with the period of Jewish acculturation and emancipation, since social dancing was arguably the most popular and intimate mixed sex leisure activity. It was moreover an important way for young people to display their obedience to the rules of fashion and etiquette while seeking out a marriage partner. Mixed sex dancing was, in short, a key way for both sexes in different ways to show their commitment to modern social norms and to display this commitment within the context of courtship. The stakes were therefore potentially quite high for the community, the family, and the individual him or herself. Writers often negotiated the thorny process of Jewish cultural engagement by putting Jews on the dance floor and describing what happens when they encounter an unsuitable dance partner. Yet the tales of these Jewish dancers often end tragically precisely because authors could not envision a successful resolution for them. Jewish women were particularly vulnerable to ill-fated love affairs since an advantageous marriage was their main form of social mobility in the literary imagination, if not necessarily in reality. The fatal mismatch between the utopian fantasy suggested by the dance floor and a society that was unprepared to deal with a controversial match meant that Jewish dancers could not find a proper place for themselves. As a result, the delights of the dance floor often led to tragic consequences. In literature, the dance floor is a microcosm of Jewish integration into broader society, whether in Europe or in the United States. Dance scenes convey the appeal of a mixed sex leisure pursuit in a seemingly permissive setting, yet also reveal the limited options for actual social mobility. Despite these overall patterns, individual scenes vary in terms of social context, type of dance, amount of description, and precise nature of engagement with non-Jewish culture. In literary plots, dance scenes embody the problems of modern Jews in a manner that was designed to appeal to readers. So we're going to get into the case study. In my talk, I will walk you through one particularly rich literary example, an 1868 German novella called Elvira. It was written by Dr. Marcus Lehmann, the rabbi of the Orthodox community of Mainz. Elvira was serialized in Der Israelit, the Orthodox journal Lehmann edited. It was later anthologized in the collection Gesammelte Erzählungen für das Jüdische Haus, which was published around 1893. Elvira is a didactic work that is narrated by a fictional rabbi who warns against intermarriage, reading romances, and mixed sex dancing. Lehmann's novella presents a strong moral lesson with just enough titillating content to keep his readers interested. And by titillating content, I also mean dancing. Actually, I mostly mean dancing. In part for this reason, when one considers the dance scenes, Elvira is actually a surprisingly sophisticated work, which helped Lehmann achieve his goals for the Orthodox press. Like his more famous contemporary, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, Lehmann was a proponent of contemporary Orthodox Judaism, or neo-Orthodoxy. While some might think of Orthodox Judaism as a form of traditional practice that was passed from generation to generation unchanged over centuries, it was, in reality, an intellectual and religious movement that developed in response to the 19th century reform movement, Jewish reform movement, since before that point, traditional Jews did not need to define their adherence to Jewish law through this kind of denominational term. Unlike Hasidism, which involved an ecstatic 
mystical form of worship, German Orthodoxy had a particularly strong intellectual component. For instance, Lehmann was a rabbi with a doctorate who had studied at several universities, and he was torn between his competing desires to be a religious leader and a poet. Fortunately, he found a good way of resolving this dilemma. According to his son, Lehmann noticed that Orthodox Judaism was losing the media battle with Reform Judaism, which had a prominent journal of its own, the Allgemeine Zeitung des Judentums, the Universal Journal of Jewry. So he decided to found the Isgalit, the Israelite. Lehmann published numerous works of fiction in his new journal, which entertained readers while encouraging them to adhere to Orthodox values. A number of these works have been reissued for Orthodox readers well into the 20th century. Just as an example, here is a picture a friend of mine in Berlin took of part of her library. As can be seen in Elvira, Lehmann thought that dance scenes were an enjoyable way to present debates about Jewish participation in German culture. Before we go any further, I'm going to briefly summarize the novella, which takes place from roughly 1848 to 1868. It recounts the life of Elvira Metz, the daughter of an upwardly mobile Jewish banker named Adolf Metz. Much to the dismay of the family rabbi, Elvira has been allowed to choose her reading material with little, influence, inter, little interference from her parents. She prefers to read European literary classics like Romeo and Juliet, which make her vulnerable to ideas of romance and flirtation on the dance floor. What's more, Avirga's parents befriend a Christian lawyer named Dr. Vedding, who claims to be a supporter of Jewish emancipation. Vedding becomes, so he thinks Jews should get civil rights. Vedding becomes a frequent guest in the Met's home until he starts paying all too much attention to 15-year-old Elvira, and her parents separate the two. Yet the couple reunites at a ball, which has disastrous consequences as far as the rabbi narrator is concerned, since Vedding proposes to Elvira and she accepts. Lehmann's novella is not on anyone's list of German literary classics. It is a melodramatic work with a fairly predictable plot. This kind of story is actually perfect for my purposes though, because it shows just how widespread literary dance scenes are. It suggests that readers may have even expected formulaic works of fiction to have mixed sex dancing, which could help spice up their moral tone. And this is not to say that dance scenes were simply a cliched plot point. The way Lehmann talks about dance shows that his novella is more complex than it might appear at first glance. First of all, he connects dancing with political ideology. Secondly, he explicitly addresses the taboo of mixed sex dancing using arguments both for and against it. Third, and finally, he demonstrates the significance of the ballroom as a space which enables certain types of social interactions. These three factors make Elvira a particularly useful example of how a literary text can illuminate Jewish debates about dancing and acculturation. Let's return to the first point. Lehmann takes care to connect the dance floor with contemporary political concerns, particularly those related to liberalism and emancipation. He frequently interrupts his romantic narrative with accounts of the rise and fall of the 1848 revolutions, events which provide an important backdrop for the motivations of Lehmann's characters. And as you may know, 1848 was basically the 1968 of the 19th century. The Jewish characters in the novella are caught between the conflicting desires to take part in secular education and non-Jewish society on the one hand, and to maintain Jewish tradition and close-knit family structures on the other. Lehman sets this conflict in sharp relief when the Metz family receives an invitation to a noble ball. Adolf initially views the ball as an opportunity to successfully integrate into German society. It represents progress and the spirit of 1848, since for once members of the bourgeoisie, including Jews, are invited. Adolf is both delighted and astonished by his family's inclusion. As he remarks to the narrator, 
Wer hätte das noch vor Jahren, wer hätte das noch vor Jahresfrist gedacht, ein Jude bei einem Hoffeste? Who would have imagined it within a year, a Jew at a court festival? Adolf allows his naive hopes for social acceptance to blind him to the threat posed by ballroom dancing. His rabbi's friend does not share in Adolf's excitement about the ball. He points out that mixed sex dancing violates Jewish law and discourages Adolf from attending the festive event. Even if the banker feels he must attend, the rabbi warns him not to bring his impressionable young daughter. The, ra the fictional rabbi's arguments follow in the footsteps of generations of real life rabbis who had to repeatedly forbid mixed sex dancing because Jews repeatedly broke the rules. As the rabbi explains dramatically, and this is one of my favorite dance quotes of all time. Du weißt, wie ich über Bälle im Allgemeinen denke. Du weißt, dass ich den Tanz als einen der gefährlichsten Sinnenreize für durchaus verwerflich halte und dass diese meine Anschauung nicht etwa eine persönliche, sondern auch eine tief im Judentum begründete ist. You know what I think of balls in general. You know that I consider dance to be one of the most dangerous and altogether reprehensible attractions for the senses, and that this opinion is not merely my own personal one, but rather one that is deeply grounded in Judaism. Doesn't that make you just want to rebel a bit and dance? This fictional rabbi would probably agree with the anonymous late medieval Sefer Hakana that dancing has the potential to corrupt women. According to this Kabbalistic text, married women who engage in mixed sex dancing will be distracted by the movements of their dance partners, even when they are later having sexual intercourse with their husbands. Yet unlike Sefer HaKana and many historical rabbinic prohibitions, Lehman's novella does not simply warn against transgressive dancing. Instead, Lehman writes a debate between his characters about whether Jews should be allowed to participate in mixed sex dancing. Adolf fires back with an argument which might have been compelling for the German Jewish bourgeoisie, pointing out that both the Bible and Talmud mention dancing on joyous occasions. In writing this dialogue, Lehman points to a paradox about dance in Jewish culture. Dancing is a symbol of joy, as is shown throughout the Bible, such as when Miriam and the Israelite women dance to celebrate the parting of the Red Sea. In fact, it is a mitzvah, or religious commandment, for wedding guests to gladden a bride by dancing before her. In the Talmud, Rabbi Aha even performs this ritual obligation by dancing with the bride on his shoulders. Although a male wedding guest is supposed to dance before a bride for her entertainment, he is forbidden from dancing with her because it could lead to sexual temptation. Rabbi Aha gets around this issue during his wedding hijinks because he claims incredibly, that for him, the bride's legs are like beams of wood. But he does not recommend this style of dancing for men who might react differently to such close proximity to a woman's body. European Jewish communities also found ways around the prohibition on mixed sex dancing, such as avoiding direct touch by dancing with a separating handkerchief. And here we see a postcard that um, gives us gives us a, um, a visual representation of the style of dancing. Let's return to the novella. Although Adolf's defense of dancing has a scriptural basis, his rabbi quickly refutes him. He points out that there is no biblical precedent for men and women dancing together. He says, Die Jungfrauen Israels führten Tänze auf, aber nicht im Vereiner mit Jünglingen, Die Männer tanzten vor der heiligen Lade, aber nicht mit fremden Leuten, Frauen. The maidens of Israel performed dances, but not in the company of youths. The men danced before the holy ark, but not with other men's wives. The rabbi explicitly states the forbidden nature of mixed sex dancing at a ball. He challenges the notions of those who, like Jewish reformers, might choose to selectively interpret biblical texts to allow all kinds of dancing. At the same time, the rabbi does not refer to the specific biblical prohibitions that are used to forbid mixed sex dancing, even though such laws might convince an observant Jew like Adolf. Instead, Lehman frames the debate around the question of acculturation, 
which is a sign of how even warnings against mixed sex dancing changed in the modern era. Adolf accuses his friend and rabbi of sounding antiquated, whereas the rabbi claims that the Book of Esther provides a warning against the dangers of Jews attending non-Jewish court functions, claiming that all the misfortunes the Jews suffer in the Book of Esther are a direct result of their participation in a Persian court feast. The rabbi seems most concerned with the possibility of intermarriage. His arguments would not necessarily prevent Jews from dancing with each other at their own social clubs, which was also a common 19th century German phenomenon. Yet Adolf is not convinced by the rabbi's reminder that the near genocide of Jews in the book of Esther was caused by Jewish and non-Jewish Persians carousing together. He cannot bear to deprive his daughter of the pleasures of the ball. Okay. Ultimately, the events of the ball transpire as the rabbi suggests. Avyaka's beauty and simple yet tasteful attire inspire Vetting's renewed interest. In the environment of the ballroom full of music and expensive perfume, Vetting is able to gaze at Avyaka, pay her compliments, and dance with her. Although Avyaka feels flustered by Vetting's seductive words and wants to go home, she's trapped at the ball and in Vetting's dangerous company because her parents are too distracted to notice. They're so caught up in the opportunity to chat and play cards with the Christian nobility that they forget to look after their daughter's welfare. While Avyaka is initially shy, Vetting slowly reveals to her over the course of several dances that he would like to marry her in a civil ceremony. Indeed, since these dances involve close contact over several repeated intervals, Vetting has a particularly good opportunity to persuade a sheltered young woman to accept his proposal, despite the significant social and familial ramifications. By the time the ball ends, after midnight, and Vetting escorts Elvira to her carriage, she suggests that he discuss marriage with her father. Crucially, it is the space of the ballroom, with its social sanction and opportunity for intermingling of the sexes over the period of several hours, which enables the fateful courtship to transpire. After the ball, Vetting asks Adolf for permission to marry Alvira using the language of universalism and liberalism. Vetting is now minister of justice and claims that marrying a Jewish woman will enable him to fulfill the open-minded politics he preaches. Vetting says Alvira will not need to convert since civil marriages are now legal. What's more, he claims that this marriage will serve the cause of enlightenment since he is a high-ranking civil servant and it would be very significant if a Jewish woman acted as his hostess. The argument is a compelling one, which successfully wins over many of Elvira's relatives. Elvira's parents and rabbi, however, remain unmoved. Conveniently for them and the traditionally religious readers of the Isgalit, Vetting's message of liberalism and love for Elvira turns out to be a mask for his villainy. Vetting does not actually love Elvira, but instead he desires her for her dowry. After they marry, he proves to be a philandering husband who harbors anti-Semitic views. Eventually, after the failure of the liberal revolutions of 1848, Vetting decides to adopt Christian dogma and pressure his wife and daughter to convert. It is at this point that Elvira leaves her husband, returns to her family, and eventually gains a measure of happiness when her daughter marries a suitable Jewish partner. While her fate is not as successful as it would have been had she allowed her parents to suggest an appropriate husband, she receives public accolades for the fact that she returned to her family and gave her own daughter the opportunity to marry someone her parents deem appropriate. Okay, so to wrap things up, ball scenes reveal the inclusion and exclusion of Jewish characters. As a result, they also chart the ways Jewish men and women experienced acculturation in gendered terms. Men felt the pressure to prove their ability to control themselves on the dance floor and to please women physically. As a result, the dance floor invoked some of the same concerns with physical prowess as sporting events and military service. Yet while such activities were homosocial, that is to say they were performed in all male spaces, the mixed sex dance floor was not. Male dancers proved their masculinity and how they interacted with women. Jewish women, on the other hand, contended with stereotypes that they were exotic, demure, and sexually available. 
Although scholars have shown that in reality, Jewish women had several options for social mobility in the 19th century, marriage remained the preferred strategy in literary representations. Stories like Eliaga often concern a sheltered daughter's love match with a suitor deemed inappropriate by her family, and the dance floor was a key location for their daring first encounter. Dance scenes were thus an important way for writers to comment critically on changes taking place in Jewish communities during the long 19th century. In my talk today, I've presented an overview of my book and given you an example of a text that uses the mixed sex dancing motif. I'd now like to give you a broader sense of the other German language texts I discuss in my book. My German corpus consists of dance scenes in texts by male and female writers in both the German and Habsburg realms. Most, but not all of these works were written during the second half of the 19th century. The Yiddish texts tend to be from the early 20th century. Many of the texts I discuss are ghetto Geschichten, ghetto tales, a genre of German language regional fiction about traditional Jewish life in Central European communities. This genre was popular with acculturated urban Jews and bourgeois Christians, so Ghetto Geschichten often included explanations of Jewish rituals and translations of Yiddish or Hebrew terms that may have been unfamiliar to readers. Dance scenes in German Jewish texts frequently portray Jews and Christians dancing together, although they also write about flirtation between more assimilated men and more traditional women. In this way, writers deployed plot elements that were designed to excite readers and inspire them to contemplate Jewish integration into European society. Since social dancing is often a way for Jewish men and women to show their participation in bourgeois culture, Jewish characters in German literary fiction are often concerned about embarrassing themselves on the dance floor. German Jewish writers typically wrote with both Jewish and Christian writers, readers in mind. As a result, they were more likely than Yiddish writers to present Jewish protagonists sympathetically to incorporate characters who fit certain Jewish stereotypes and to educate their audiences about the evils of anti-Semitism. For most of my talk, I have focused on sources from the long 19th century. These texts were written in a context in which dancing was regarded as a real threat to communal morality. Orthodox writers such as Marcus Lehmann used transgressive dancing to warn against behavior which violated traditional Jewish law whereas more secular writers deployed dance scenes to criticize anti-Semitism or attack the perceived backwardness of Jewish orthodoxy. In all these cases, dance scenes are used to underscore the social position of Jewish women. But dance scenes do not need to be so polemical. In my research, I found that contemporary novels, television, and film use Jewish mixed sex dancing as a way of helping female characters explore their own sexuality, as we have seen in Unorthodox. In comparison with 19th and early 20th century literature, contemporary works are less interested in policing the boundaries of Jewish communities or punishing characters for violating communal norms. Although an orthodox demonstrates that female suffering can still be used to make a, pol a polemical point, contemporary authors are generally able to envision more opportunities for their her heroines to assert their desires and sexuality, both on the dance floor and off. I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, I want to invite the participants to um, post in the Q&A if they have any questions. Leslie, is there anything that you that comes to mind to you to ask um, right away? Um, if not, I can begin. No, um, I'd love to open it up to the audience as a whole. And um, but Sonia, thank you so very much. This was wonderful and ties in in really interesting ways to what we're doing in class. So I'm sure uh, some of the students here might have a question. It looks like we have um, a question in the chat already from Frankie. Hello, Frankie. Lovely to see you here. Um, it's, it's a longer question. I wonder, uh, Frankie, if you would like to unmute to ask or um, or Sonia, you can also uh, read here and, and answer how, as you see fit. Um, 
Oh, this is great because um, I can like give you a little bit of my, my secret queer reading of my book because in a lot of ways, I feel like this book was very much about um, Jews adopting sort of European notions of heterosexuality. And so I'm thinking about Daniel Boyarin's book on heroic conduct, which is about, which deals with um, Jewish masculinity and um, the process of Jews, Jewish masculinity becoming sort of more in line with what we would consider straight European masculinity. But anyway, this is my book and my book cover. And so the secret thing here is that I'm actually not sure whether um, this dancer is a man or a woman. Um, we only have an initial and there were actually two dancers in the company with the same last name, so related to each other, that actually have like somewhat similar faces and one's a man and one's a woman. Um, and I'm not sure which one this is. This being said, um, even though I think this is like kind of like a, um, yeah, my secret queer reading of the book's cover, um, most of the examples that I found are very much about heterosexual courtship, although there are some interesting exceptions that we get. Um, and these, so one of the big things that happens is when you have a sort of homoerotic energy on the dance floor, when, for instance, there's a um, novella, a 19th century no novella by Leopold Kompert, that's one of these examples of uh, ghetto, ghetto tales, um, where you have these two men, one, um, one Jewish, the other, it, they're both, um, it's, it takes place in Bohemia, rural Bohemia. So one, one, one of these young men is Jewish, the other one is uh, Catholic, and um, they, they both start dancing at this peasant dance, um, and they're dancing with women, but the interactions on the dance floor, it's more about the interactions with each other, even though they're, and they're using women basically as plots, as props, but it's, um, it's sort of this tension between these two men. Um, there's also an example in Gertrude Kolmau's um, novel, Anne Jewish Mutter, a Jewish, um, Jewish uh, mother in Berlin, which, um, which has a character stumble into a, um, sort of like a, a, a gay dance hall, which she doesn't realize, and she dances with a dancer who it turns out is in drag. Um, but these examples were really interesting, um, but for the most part, characters, uh, the, these scenes are mostly focused on heterosexual courtship. Um, that sounds like a great article topic though, hey? <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, and then Nick asks um, uh, about the type of research you did for the book. Um, were you in the archives? Were you, how did you go about that? Um, yeah, so there was, so some of it was in the archives and um, a lot of it was reading. So I did, I mean, finding where these dance scenes were was um, quite a challenge because for the most part, people hadn't been paying attention to the dance scenes. Um, and there's a field of literary dance studies that's a form of literary analysis that pays attention to the dance scenes, um, but that's more developed in English literature. To my knowledge, this is the, I'm the first person to really focus on this in a Jewish studies context. Um, so if I would read literary histories or look in book indices, they often didn't mention dance at all. Um, I remember once going to an archive, the Leo Beck Institute in Jerusalem and doing a search um, for tants, for dance, and I got a lot of hits for books that were published in Constance, but nothing that was related to dance itself. Um, so some of it was reading on my own. Some of it was looking in literary histories and trying to um, you know, see what was going on, looking in indices for, for weddings, if there were wedding scenes, like things like that. If I knew there were romantic plots, sometimes that would um, show up. And then I'd also just go to conferences or meet with scholars, and then I would just like accost people and just be like, I'm doing this research, please tell me about dance scenes. So actually, Elvira, um, I mean, I'm really happy that I get to mention this. Um, the person who was probably the most useful in terms of like people I accosted at conferences was our um, late departed colleague, um, Jonathan Hess, who was a wonderful role model and who, his scholarship is amazing on 19th century Jewish popular, German Jewish um, middle brow literature. And I went to him at a conference and I told him what I was working on and I barely knew him. And he was like, I'll, I'll look through my notes. And he like sent me a list of these like books that I might not have 
or like serialized novels and texts of that sort that I might not have found otherwise. And Alviro was one of them, and I remain profoundly grateful to him for that. Awesome, thanks. Let's see. And Emma has a question. Uh, what drew you to this topic and what is the most interesting thing you've discovered in the process of writing your book? These are all great questions. Yeah, they're wonderful. Um, so thank you for all these questions. So um, initially I was interested in doing research that had to do, is it the, sort of the question of um, how Jewish, how young women were being depicted as sort of vectors of Jewish modernity um, and basically how some of these like rebellious choices of um, daughters, like if you think of Fiddler on the Roof, Tevye's daughters, this is like a classic example from uh, sort of Yiddish culture. Um, and so sort of thinking about that, where like how is how does this show that modernity is often a story of women making choices about their their own personal lives? Um, so I've sort of had that percolating in my mind since before I started graduate school. Um, but meanwhile, I I've danced for most of my life, and when I started learning. Um, Yiddish literature, or I started learning Yidd Yiddish language, it was pretty, it made sense to me that I would also learn about um, the dances that, that were performed in that context. And so I would go to dance workshops. And at some point I thought to, when I was in, in graduate school that if I was, um, if I was writing about dance, and I'd written one paper, one term paper already that had dance as a topic, I was like, if I, if I write about dance, then, and that's my thing, I could also apply for funding to continue going to these dance these dance workshops, and wouldn't that be a great way to spend my summers? Um, so I thought, okay, I, I'll, I'll try um, doing that. And then I realized that that was actually just like a really great way to bring in all these issues related um, to gender and partner choice and the body that I was interested in, um, and that it was also a perspective that hadn't really been examined before. So there were really so many things that I could think about. Um, and then eventually I also got invited to speak at these festivals and then I didn't have to worry about um, the funding because I could be on staff. So that, that was great. Um, great, yeah, that sounds good. Leslie, I just wanted to check in with you on time. Um, how much time did we? Well, I think we have a bit more time till 2.15. I'm thrilled okay. with the students in the class. And I see Isaiah has a question. And then I have actually something I'd like to raise. But let's let's first hear from Isaiah. Let's see, uh, Isaiah's question is, do you think the prevalence of mixed nomination and mixed religion dance uh, marriages in modern Western society would be shocking for a 19th century audience? Maybe it might be difficult to understand someone living in this day and age but uh yeah can you give us oh, a glimpse is, into the uh yeah 19th century customs this is a really interesting question that i hadn't really thought about from this perspective um i think i think what would be the most shocking to them actually is that these sort of mixed marriages could take place and that they could often be viewed as non problematic, because a lot of the literature from this period, especially German literature, as opposed to Yiddish literature, um, is dealing with these mixed relationships, or actually, they're both, I mean, like both of these literatures, and like other literatures as well, are dealing with various types of mixing, like I talk about mixed sex dancing, but it's not actually as controversial, unless there's other forms of mixing. Um, because then it's people who would be not viewed as appropriate partners by um, their parents, for instance. Um, and so it's not always based on religion, um, but this question also notes that. So, um, so this was a topic that was fascinating to people. Um, it's so transgressive and you get this in a lot of texts in, in German literature, you get a bit more where you have different religions, but people are fascinated by this topic. The thing is that it, they're fascinated by it and they have these stories of romances um, that are seen as controversial, but then they don't go well. Um, so like I noticed, for instance, that when, when couples flirt on the dance floor, 
but then they don't try and do something like get married or have a relationship after dances, um, then they tend to be okay. But you get some really tragic outcomes when people try and continue these relationships. But if you look at more recent literature, for instance, you can have situations where people are engaged in these sorts of relationships and it's just not seen as much of an issue. And you also, in real life, people find ways to make these relationships work in a way that maybe in the 19th century wouldn't have been seen as, um, as an option. Um, so one example of a contemporary text that um, I just love, um, partially because it relates to a television show that I've enjoyed, um, but the Miss Fisher's, um, the Raisins and Almonds, so from the Miss Fisher, um, Austrian, sorry, Aust Australian, um, Australian mystery series and the book version as opposed to the television one. So it's this mystery novel with a Jewish theme. Um, the, the heroine, who's like very much not Jewish, gets involved with a Jewish man and she basically describes it as she's just borrowing him. And nobody, it, it, everyone's okay with this. Like, you know, she explains this to his mother who wants him to marry a Jewish woman and everybody's fine. I mean, the only controversy is that um, that even though they're the best foxtrot dancers at the Jewish club and for the foxtrot competition, um, they're not really allowed to win because they think that the winning partner, or the winning couple should be comprised of two members of the club and she's not a member of this Jewish club um, because she's not Jewish. So um, I guess another thing about these contemporary novels is that um, in some ways, and they're, they're about these boundary transgressions, but like, the civilization that existed then, the sorts of um, transgressions of the, the sort of the boundaries and the threat to the society, in some ways after the Holocaust happened, like nothing else is going to be that extreme. Um, so there's a lot less about policing boundaries and it's a lot more about other sorts of things, especially uh, characters exploring their own sexuality. If I can maybe just, I just have a quick thought, Sonia, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then it looks as if we have another question from David Kaminsky. Um, you know, when you started with Unorthodox, I suddenly flashed to the opening um, credits of Transparent that were shown, that are shown each time. And that is there, if you recall, there is that, this, the, it's a dance scene, I believe from a bar mitzvah, but it's only shown as a kind of collage. So it's actually hard to tell. Um, but I was thinking um, in response to your, uh, your answer to Frankie's question about um, the queer dimension or the transgressive uh, qualities. Um, the other thing I actually kept thinking about simply because I happened to have watched it last night was Passing. I don't know if you've seen it yet, the new from the Nella Larson, the new Netflix show um, about, it, not at all about Jewish culture, but I was thinking too about, it'll be interesting when you do see it to look at the dance scene in that um, as another moment, both of a kind of homoerotic, um, merging of different, you know, subject positions. So it, and also that sort of re-entry into, you know, away from passing and a full immersion in the case of this one character into a uh, fully African-American setting through the dance. It's a dance and music sort of moment. So I was just wondering sort of where this, if this has just thinking of those two examples, there are countless others. If this has also taken you then to arenas, you know, outside German Jewish culture and how your thinking ha has been on that. That is interesting. Um, and like, I mean, I've, I've only wa I watched parts of Transparent for the dance scenes in, the, um, in Berlin, um, and, uh, but that didn't really have, I, yeah, I don't, I remember just thinking that they were too brief. So I don't have so much else to say about Transparent um, specifically. And like the past discussion in the passing made me think of Carrie Wallach's book, um, Passing Illusions, which sort of takes some of these same sorts of ideas of passing into um, a Weimar German context. And um, one of the texts that she um, discusses, um, An Atensorin uh, by uh, Clementina Keimer, and it deals with a woman who ends up dancing and sort of passes as not being Jewish. Um, in the context of how um, Carrie Wallach discusses Jewish recognizability. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I I mean I I love watching things that have dance scenes. Um, yeah. And I like one one um, one particular film that I watched where I thought that it had very sort of like some similar issues um, was the the film Brooklyn, where you had a um, an Irish woman and a who comes to the United States and meet an Italian American man mm-hmm. in um, in New York at a at a dance. Um, and I was thinking, like, oh, that's you know, that's not um, you know, not in the same context that I work on, but there's some similar um, you know, similar issues. And I'm sure that I will like think of many, many, many more examples um, mm. as soon as this call is over. But I think a lot of these um, these issues about about dance are quite universal. Um, and it's and like especially things like reading dance as a text, using it as an opportunity for character development. These things are not um, are not specific to German Jewish culture. Um, you have some great examples in in German literature as well. Um, for instance, Werther and Lotte um, begin their their interaction at a dance um, where Werther mm-hmm. thinks that they because um, they connect so well during a waltz that that means that they will be able to um, have a successful relationship. Um, and there's many popular culture examples as well. But what I think the piece that gets really interesting with um, in Jewish texts um, is that how it relates to how it becomes a metaphor for this sort of these questions about acculturation and modernization and a lot of these um, phenomena that are happening in the modern Jewish experience. Okay, I think there's a question from David next. Let's see, have you considered, um, thank you for the compelling talk, have you considered how the physical power relations of lead follow partner dancing of the 19th century has a manifestation of bourgeois gender dynamics uh, relates to the participation of Jewish men and women in that moment? Um, it's a really intriguing question. I hope I'm understanding um, properly what, um, what's meant by that. But I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about how these bourgeois partner dances or these partner dances relate to some of the changes um, in Jewish gender roles during this period, especially for Jewish masculinity, is that this is a form of masculinity that's accomplished uh, not by you know, being the best, being able to like win a Talmud dispute in a yeshiva or by being able to be the most you know, physically strong in a, um, in a gymnastics club, the, this is, or being able to shoot the best um, in a military unit. And this is a form of masculinity where you prove yourself by being able to give pleasure to women on the dance floor and being able to um, perform using the, the correct type of etiquette and demonstrating the correct posture and showing that you have this sort of physical training and to a certain degree also emotional training that you're doing all the things that you're supposed to do and that's what's going to get you um, a wife and allow you to become a head of a household and have your own children and perpetuate um, you know all these things. Um, so that's something that I found really um, really interesting about um, how this uh, how um, dancing relates to some of these um, issues of de- gender dynamics. Um, I hope that answers the question uh, to some degree. Yeah, I love that framing around female pleasure. That's a really important aspect to dancing that I hadn't thought about before. Let's see. I think Lucas has a question, but I let's look at the bottom. When you talked about the scene from Unorthodox, the scene that you described made me think of a current trope in a lot of European media and legislation that women need to be rescued from restrictive religious law by conventional Western society. Typically, this is directed at Muslim women and the context for the scene and other things you've talked about are very different. But did these tropes or variations on them surface at all during your research? Yes, absolutely. It came up a lot. Um, where So I gave you an example um, where my extended example today was from Marcus Neyman, um, which is like interesting to me too, because like a lot of times when people think about the German Jewish experience, it's often acculturated German Jews who are maybe members of the reform movement um, or are completely secular 
um, were largely secular. And so like this you know, orthodox example is something that might, might seem surprising. But a lot of the authors that I was looking at really do think of traditional Judaism as somehow backward. And they are interested in if, whether women are able to escape from this particular um, this sort of uh, society. So like one, one um, author I find really interesting in this context is, um, is Akal Emil Franzos, um, who was born in uh, Galicia, which is the sort of region of Poland that was under Habsburg control. And so he um, didn't, even though he was like in this region that's like often associated with like um, traditionally observant Jews or Hasidim, um, he actually didn't have a, um, a, a, a Jewish upbringing, really, any sort. And so early in his career, he would write these uh, ghetto tales, um, and it would a lot of it would be showing how these women are trapped, and um, think they're you know they have they have, they really don't have any options um, other than arranged marriages with men who are. Um, are not good uh, emotional partners for them, or they uh, and they won't get a good education, or they end up becoming the um, the mistresses of Christian men, and they just like really don't have very many options um, for themselves. Um, and so he so he was born in about 1848, or he liked to say he was born in 1848 because of the revolutions um, that made him seem like such a good liberal, but. Um, by 1890, by which point he had moved to Berlin, um, there was a rise in anti-Semitism. And so his, um, the way his stories changed. Um, and so he went from early in the career being uh, most, having, aiming most of his criticism at these Jewish communities, um, like around 1890 or 1891, when he writes his novel, Ludwig Trachtenberg, um, He's focused in the, the sort of like helpless, hopeless situation and the, the sense of being in a bind. He identifies that more with anti-Semitism than with the restrictions within the Jewish community. Um. Great, thank you. And we have another question, perhaps maybe the final question um, in the chat from Gary, um, who says in contemporary Orthodox society, because it can because it can lead to mixed dancing is the punchline of a joke. Um, an intermediate step slash warning that, for example, eating ham or woman leading prayer services will lead to mixed dancing. It applies to both men and women has a warning that the transgression will lead to dancing, which then leads to all sorts of other transgressions. The biggest concern, of course, being intermarriage or leaving orthodoxy. Uh, you describe something that applies to women primarily when did the um, I think trans I think transition to men and women begin, and is it directly tied to your thesis? Um, so thank you for mentioning um, this joke or the punchline of the joke. Um, I mean, the very very brief version of it is like why um, you know why aren't Jews allowed to have sex standing up because it could meet, or, or it could lead to dancing, um, but it's, um, I have a more elaborate version actually at the beginning of my introduction. So if you want to take a look at um, my book and um, I'm actually going to put the, the, if you order my book from Stanford University Press, you can get a 20% discount with Gollins 20. And um, so, yeah, so I start the book, uh, the book with this joke and this, um, the punchline, it could lead to dancing has become this sort of catchphrase for all sorts of things that um, that are considered forbidden in um, in a Jewish community, and it's sort of a way of showing, like, hey, I know the rules well enough that I can also kind of make fun of these restrictions. Um, and so, I um, that was one of the reasons why I was like really happy to also explore this deeper literary context for something that people tend to sort of talk about in a silly way today. And I'm really glad that I was able to share that with you um, today. And you can be in touch with me in the future if, that, if you are interested in this topic. And thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for coming and sharing this research and these ideas. Um, I don't know, Leslie, if you had any closing remarks or Daniel, was it German and European studies? 
I don't yes. know all the acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Department of German, Nordic, Slavic, and Dutch. Now, Sonia, thank you so much. And I also want to thank the students who all asked such wonderful questions today. And I'm certain that our conversation in class will continue um, as we probe you know, the really, really wonderful lecture that you gave today. So thank you. Thank you so much. I also join in a big thank you. And thank you all for coming today for this lecture. We hope we, well, we can have you here in person, Sonia, in the future. So thank That'll you so wonderful. much.